right there. Pit mic. Thank you. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit different this morning before we open. As you see, there's some pictures going across your uh, screen there. And if you'll notice in your bulletin today, we have a little note there about in memory of Miss Dot Brock, who uh, was a faithful member here at Aceville Baptist Church for many, many years. And uh, I know she meant a lot to a lot of people and in their lives. And I I just wanted to take a couple of moments just to, to really just uh, remember her. These flowers are a part of our church today and will be a part of our church in the days ahead that we're given in memory of her. And then also just wanted to kind of just say a few things about her that have been brought to my attention, and I got to know her along the way. You know, Miss, Miss Dot Brock, uh, when you think about that, uh, how many of you remember or in your time? Yeah, I thought so. So many of you did, and she meant a lot. And and I had, uh, you know, Miss Dot loved Aceville Baptist Church. She loved the people here, and she loved everybody. And, and, and one of the things that I remembered uh, uh, sharing, and I've, I've heard some stories, I remember when she worked down the road here, and during her lunch break there for a while, it, she would go and she would check on people that were sick and making sure they were taken care of on her lunch break. And she had such a caring heart and a loving heart, and she would do that. I think, Ms. Dale, you mentioned she did that for your mom and dad for the last years there, that they were sick there. She would come at lunch and just make sure they were taken care of and just cared about them. And I'm sure there's other stories of other people like that. And for me, I was, I was blessed because over the last uh, four years, I'd got to know Miss Dot at the Iva nursing home. Miss Dot, uh, usually she'd be, if, if it was late, she'd be sitting right there. She'd be sitting up front, and she'd wait for me, and if she had a, one of the clear days, she'd know and remember me, and she'd just smile. She always would greet you with a smile, and it was so much fun for me to just meet with her and talk with her. But the thing that I always noticed about Miss Dodd, and, and I'll share a little bit more as I close, in a minute when I close, was she was always wanting to serve or help somebody. She'd always say, well, if you, if you know anything or you got some socks, bring them. The people here love socks. Miss Dale, I think she got you to bring a lot of socks, didn't she? She loved socks, and she would share them with the other residents there. And, and she would say, hey, we're going to have a singing, and, and I'll take them here and there. And a lot of times she would just do things. And, and, and I just remember how she would constantly be helping something. I remember Miss Fran, like you and I, we kind of told her that our families were there, and she kind of took a, a liking to them. I know she, I told her my Aunt Faye was there, and then Polly was there, and a lot of times, Faye and Polly's room were together, and I would go in their room, and Miss Dot would come in before I leave and, and talk to Polly and say, Polly, you want to go play bingo? And Miss, Miss Dot would push Polly's wheelchair up to the front because she wanted her to be with everybody else. And she would go in and check on all of these residents and how she was, and she was like that. And, you know, uh, the, the last few weeks of Miss Dot's life, and this was what her roommate, Miss Vaughn, shared with us. And I want to share it with you because I think you'll all agree this is what Miss Dot's life really was about. The last few weeks of Miss Dot's life, her roommate shared that I think she kind of knew that maybe it was getting time to go to her real home. Said that a couple of times she gathered up her belongings or as many as she could get in her lap and headed to the front door. And they would ask her, where are you going? I'm going to see Mama and Daddy. I think God was preparing her for the time that she was because, you see, Miss Dot passed away on 10-17, October the 17th. I understand she went to sleep early, a little bit no earlier than normal, and she never woke up. You know, in my Bible, in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Miss Dot went to sleep on October the 17th there at Iva Rehab. But when she did wake up, she woke up in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Isn't that a great testimony? I think the ones that know Miss Dot know how much she loved you all and she loved the church. I even you saw some of those pictures. She never got married, but I understand she was pretty smart. Antreville High School. I mean, a lot of us don't even know where that was at, but some of you do. She was a member of the National Bader Club. But she was always, and if you ever went to visit her, she wanted to, the directory. 
church director. She was always working on that church director. But she would always tell me to tell y'all something. You tell the people there at Aceville, I love them, and I'm praying for them. You know, I think she was. She might not have called you by name, but she did call you by church family. And that's what we wanted to do today is just to remember her. They were, they did, the family did not have a, a service, but we wanted to have something just to remember Miss Dockvot by. And I'm going to just pray right quick, and it, it, not quick, but I'm going to pray. And as I pray, then as I finish, then we're going to start our church service. But I just wanted to have this brief time just to remember a dear saint that had meant a lot to this church. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the life of Miss Dot Brock. We thank you for her life and, Lord, how she served this church for many years. She loved Aceville Baptist Church, but the reason she loved Aceville Baptist Church, Father, was because she loved you and she knew you loved her. Oh, Father, she, uh, she is an example of what we're even going to talk about today, gratitude. And, Lord, she is such an example of how she loved other people <coughs> and just wanted to serve. And, Father, she learned that from your word, and she learned that from the example that she learned through Jesus. Father, we thank you for her and her life, and we pray, Father, today that maybe something that we share today would just encourage someone, because I know that's what Miss Brock would want us to be, is an encourage uh, people today. Thank you again for all your blessings, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Stand as we sing, worthy of worship. Stand in as we sing. Well, welcome again as we come to our time for welcome and announcements. I just want to make a few brief uh, comments uh, and uh, just make sure you know tonight we will not have service here at Aceville, but we do encourage you, if you feel can, to come down to John Delhi. They'll be having the uh, their festive, uh, festival this afternoon and uh, from 2 to uh, 7, but from 4 to 7 we'll be having the uh, trunk of treats or as long as our candy lasts. So uh, you're to be there. If you are one of the ones that are going to do your trunk and you have not filled out the paperwork, don't panic. Take it with you. If you don't have it, get with me. But I think we, we've got, there were a couple of you, uh, they just told us you could bring that when you come today if you have not filled that out and given it to me yet. Uh, also, if you would just see all the other things next Sunday morning, we will have baptism for Jackson Major. So just be in prayer for that. And then remember next Sunday night, our fall for fest, fall for. Uh, for Jesus Festival, uh, Miss Eden, is there anything there that we need? No. If you have any questions or want to bring anything, just see Miss Eden. Remember, November the 9th will be our 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 the sound uh, concert. Just remember that. 
And then also, you'll notice, and I just want to just make a, a, a note here, the family of Miss Betty Martin, if you see the, the gr a wonderful contribution that was given to our youth ministry, and we just are thankful for that family and how they have blessed our church and blessed our, our youth, and uh, we're just praying, and I hope you'll help us pray about where God would want us, because that money will be given to, that our youth can grow in Christ, and we just wanted to make that note. We think that her family, that's Miss Caroline's mother, so just remember them in your prayers, and just thank them so much for that generous gift there also. That's all the announcements I have at this time. Is there anything that I need to just mention before we move to our prayer time? Thank you, Randall. That is great. So that's it. If this time we're going to move on to our prayer time, you can see our list is very long. I know all of you have been in prayer for Mark Murdoch's family. I know God uh, was just so gracious this past week. We're all saddened by the loss of Mark, but we are so thankful that Mark's no longer hooked up to any machines or hooked up to anything and bedridden. And these last couple of weeks have really been uh, hard on him and the family, but just continue to pray for his family. If you didn't get the one call, the service will be here Tuesday at 2.30. Uh, receive friends prior to that, 1 to, two, uh, uh, 1 to 2 here at the church, and then the service at 2.30, and the burial will be at Mount Bethel. So we just ask you to be in prayer for, for Debbie and the girls and his, his dad and his sister and uh, other family members. I know they greatly appreciate it. Uh, also, there's many others that need our prayers. And uh, just uh, is there anybody that you want to just lift up by name right quick before we go to the Lord? That is Miss Mary's uh, daughter who's been in the hospital in ICU. So let's remember Miss Cindy as we pray. How about others? Yes, sir, Mr. Robert. Mr. Baxter, we'll be praying for you, sir. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much. But we'll be praying for you, sir. We sure will. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Anybody else? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask his blessings upon all these. And then also the remaining part of our service. Father God, we thank you so much for today. What a wonderful day it is to be in your house. And what a wonderful day it is just to proclaim the great name of Jesus Christ. Father God, what a day it will be one day when we've talked about two of our, our saints that have been very big in part of our church for Miss Dodd and even Mark, Lord, how they have. Lord, they're, they're in your presence. What a day that will be when we see them and see you again, Father. That's our prayer. And Lord God, we just ask your blessings upon all these that are listed on our bulletin. Lord, there's many that need our, our prayers. We pray for Mr. Baxter as he'll be going to uh, a surgery tomorrow. Just be with him and his recovery, Lord. We just pray all to go well. For Miss Mary's daughter, Cindy, we lift her up and pray she'll be facing surgery, Lord, that all would go well and her recovery also would be good. And Lord, that you would just keep them both healthy. Lord, I know there's many others, my dad, and, and, and Lord, I, I, my mind will miss them. So everyone that is on the hearts of our people who are sitting in this room, Father, we pray for them and just pray your blessings upon them. And Lord God, we just pray as we continue to worship you in song, Father, that you would just fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you remove anything that would hinder our prayers and our, our worship to come before your throne? And Father, we just pray that everything that we say, everything that we see will do one thing, and that would be to just glorify your name. Thank you again, Father, for what you have done and what you're going to do, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to change things up just a little bit. He said that song, what a day that will be. You know, that's, that's our prayer, isn't it? So I feel like we need to sing that song this morning. We've seen Miss Dodd, and we know about Mark, and what, what a day Friday was for him. Let's stand as we sing what a day that will be. Get out your green books. 607. 607.
something a little different today and it's not in your bulletin but we're going to ask all our children's church kids if you go to children's church and, and children come on up front right here and sit in front of where Mr. Randall is will you come on up right quick come up right quick and come right here we're going to start we're going to try this and we're going to see we love our children we want their, our children to know how important it is to be a part of our worship so we're going to have a children's moment every week about this time we're going to see how it works out in our schedule and we want everybody to kind of Today, Randall's going to do it for the next few Sundays, and hey, I might incorporate one of you all to do it pretty soon, but we just want our kids and just encourage them all to come, and parents, if you need to come with them, you can bring them up the first couple of times, and then hopefully before long, and right after this, then we'll do our, uh, Randall will tell you to do our hands of fellowship, and our children are going off to Children's Church. Go ahead, Randall. All right. Good morning.
Let me tell y'all something. <clears throat> y'all looking at one of the dirtiest pumpkins in the patch. I'm, I, I don't know. I wasn't bought at the store. <laughs> but uh, when I go give my testimony to other churches and stuff, I tell them, you know, a lot of the miracles that God's done in my life. But the biggest miracle that he's ever did for me bar none, was he took that old dirty pumpkin and he turned it into something clean. Amen. I thought that was a very good lesson, Randall. Thank you for it. But uh, this song that I picked, I guess, goes along with the pumpkin patch. <clears throat> The day I went back to the place where I used to go And I saw the same old crowd I knew before And when they'd ask me what had happened I tried to tell them Thanks to Calvary I don't come here anymore Thanks to Calvary I am not 
the man I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than before. And as the tears ran down my face, I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't come here anymore and then today I went back to where we used to live and my little girl ran and hid behind the door But I said, honey, you don't have to be afraid because you've got a new daddy now. And thanks to Calvary, we don't live here anymore. Thanks to Calvary, I am not the man I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than before. And as the tears ran down my face, I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't come here. Anymore. Amen. Amen. You're fine, brother. You're fine. Thank you, Dwight, for a beautiful song. Thank you for all the music so far. And Debbie, thank you all for being here. It means a lot to us today for you all to be here. What a great testimony it is. And uh, thank you, girls and boys, for being here. We just thank you so much. And it kind of goes, I tell you, the, uh, we're in the month, fixing to be in the month of November. Can you believe that? 11th month, and uh, we kind of start looking toward Thanksgiving, right? Kind of getting us there. I'm sure it won't, you, if you, 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 there won't be a whole lot of stuff in the stores about Thanksgiving unless you go to Hobby Lobby or somewhere, but they're going to be pushing Christmas pretty, pretty soon. But I wanted us to start, and we're going to look, we just finished up the, the Harvest Series, and we're going to even, you're going to be hearing more things for us to still do some things to for, for evangelism, but I wanted to start for the next few sermons talking about gratitude. Gratitude. We've heard songs, Randall sharing about the pumpkin and, and how thankful we are that we have a Savior who can clean us up. No matter how dirty we are, you know, a lot of times that's the hard part for people to get saved is they don't think they're that dirty. But, you know, the gratitude, the receiving and giving of God's grace is what I want to think. This past week, 
uh, you know, Thursday, I, I shared with y'all last week about having to do a funeral for a 36-year-old young man. Then we all were saddened and shocked by Mark's death. And, and you know, uh, we go back, and in the last uh, few months, Miss Dodd and, and others, we think about Mark uh, Ellens, who passed away, who had been attending our church. You know, when people start, and when we start to mourn the loss of someone, we, we start reflecting and start thinking a little bit in our own life. Sometimes it's out of shock, anger, and even possible, possibly sometimes we even deny things. Well, that's not going to happen to me. But you know, when we start to wrestle with a lot of these things in life, we ask ourselves questions like this when we start looking at it. What is most important in our life? What is most important in our life? How do I live fully so that I'm ready for my time when God calls me home to die? Well, I'll leave a legacy. You know that we were yesterday morning, and just let me say thank you for all that showed up yesterday for the work day. If you look around, the church got cleaned up. They didn't get in my office, but they did clean up some other stuff. And, and, and they really, just thank you so much, George Ann and all. I think over, probably close, over 30 people showed up for work day. So thank you all so much. But uh, before that, we were talking in our men's ministry about legacy. And you know, a lot of times we'll ask ourselves, will I leave a legacy that benefit those who I leave behind? And then you ask the question, another question maybe like, how will I what I build in this life carry into my eternal life. Do you ever stop and think about that? You know, a lot of times we talk about what we're leaving behind, but we need to look at that last question pretty big. How will what I built in this life carry into my eternal life? Guys, just remember, you ain't, we're not taking anything to heaven that we, we made here or built here on earth. Okay? I'm not taking any of these clothes, so if I, the rapture happens while I'm preaching, it's going to fall. And if my belt slips off, just so you'll know, my pants are gone because I've lost 50 pounds. <laughs> so if you hear me do this, that means I'm clicking my belt, okay? <laughs> it's getting loose. But, you know, we're not going to carry anything with us. And, but, you know, as humans, we desire a life of worth, of significance. I mean, that's just who we are. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of our DNA. And, you know, a lot of times, significance is in the eye of the beholder a lot of times. If you go back in 22, a lot of the people that died were people like uh, the, the Chaz Bos the Bozeman guy from Anderson that was a big movie star, or uh, Kobe Bryant. Those were names that people throw out there. They had significance, but really, did they have anything they were leaving behind in their legacy? But you know, our significance a lot of times is in the eye of the beholder. And if we believe our life carries a weight of goodness that benefits the world and, and, and those we love now and, and the hereafter, we'll desire to leave this world knowing it served the people. And I think about Miss Dodd. Outside of us and the people at Ivor, not a lot of people knew her. But she left this world with a great, great desire of serving people. And she did serve people. I can also say Mark Murdoch has served people. He has made an impact that's going to last for eternity. And you see, that's what the gratitude that I want to talk about. So that's the question I want to ask. So what makes our life significant? What makes it significant? We know that work, play things, our group of people, or I call it our tribe of people, our house investments, and even our service can add value to our lives, but they don't define it. Therefore, if, if we want or, or if I want my life to be significant, what underlying values or practices should I be participating in so that it is significant now? Have you ever asked, what should I be doing right now to make an impact on someone's life or have a significant in the life later on. The Bible tells us right here that the practice of gratitude gives us a life here and it also gives us eternal significance. You see, through gratitude, we appreciate life's goodness which compels us to pay it forward. How many of you have ever been sitting in the drive-thru lane 
and told the girl up there, hey, I'm paying for the person behind you. Just pay it forward. You hear that a lot today because people want, they have a conscience, they just want to do something good. And don't get me wrong, that's good, but is that what it's all about? You see, through gratitude, we appreciate life's goodness, which compels us to pay it forward, and gratitude creates within us deep sense of happiness and satisfaction. I mean, that's why we do it. Paying it forward, you do it because of the satisfaction. And you know, when that happens, it helps and enriches our relationships. It helps to nurture us and it helps us to grow. And it, and it kind of helps us to do a lot of things like that in our world to just have relationships. That's missing in our world. Gratitude is something that's missing. Would you agree? I mean, gratitude... How many of you, when you were raising your children or you're raising children now, the first thing you teach them, our little, the youngest grandson, we love to go when we go to child, he's learned to say, thank you, and we love it. It's just the way you say it when you're a child. But how many of you teach your children to make sure, make sure you say thank you? That's just a part of what we're doing. But it's a missing in our world today, the gratitude. So I asked this morning, what is gratitude? Gratitude is the practice of actively remembering and expressing the grace, which is the benefits we do not deserve, okay? For Christians, we don't deserve it. But it's the benefits we do not deserve and the goodness bestowed in our lives. That's what gratitude really is. You see, we have an inner desire to show gratitude. We have that inner desire because you do. You do. Really, you don't, do you really have to teach people to say thank you? It's in there. Why don't we do it? Sometimes we say, well, you just don't do that today. But we inside have an inner desire to show gratitude for the goodness and grace we receive. I want us today, we're going to look in Genesis chapter 8, verses 15 through 20. And, and Noah, this is a story about Noah, and there's a story here that we can pick up from. We witness right here one of the first acts of gratitude through the life of Noah. Through the life of Noah we see it. In Genesis 8 verses 15 through 20. And I'm reading from the ESV version this morning. So bear with me. But just it'll be pretty much what you've got in most of them. But then God said to Noah. Go out from the ark. You and your wife and your sons and your sons wives with you. Bring out with you every living creature that is with you, all flesh, birds, animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird with everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. Verse 20. And then Noah built an altar. To the Lord, and took some of the every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. After being on the ark for approximately a full year, Noah walks off the boat. A lot of times we miss what miss this sometimes. Noah walks off the boat, Noah builds an altar for the Lord. Noah's first recorded act upon leaving the ark was the, an act of gratitude. An act of gratitude. Now when you, a lot of times like I said, when we read this and even when you're listening to this, this act of worship is a lot of times really very easily read over. Just overlooked. You see, if we don't really close and look at it real close, we'll miss that simple practice of gratitude. But when we do uh, dig in a little bit more, we see a little bit more the, the big or extraordinary uh, example of thankfulness that Noah has right here. I want us to just consider for just a moment, if you would with me, just a moment. Think about this. This fact, Noah spent approximately 365 days on the ark. As he walks off the plank, and I, you know, I'm just saying this, this is my own little thing I think he done. Noah makes a conscious decision that the very first thing he will do is say, thank you God. Thank you, God. Now listen, God didn't direct this. All right? God didn't direct him to do this. 
You see, think about this. These are some notes that you can think about, and I'm going to lay the foundation of where I'm trying to go with this. At this time in ancient history or in this Near Eastern civilization that was going on before God wiped out, God had not given commandments or statues regarding worship. There was none for worship. So God had not kind of took this on. See, there was no organized religion. There was no organized faith practices. All that was still a thousand years away. We'll read about it in Exodus 20. So we're here in Genesis, and so it's years away before any of this ever gets organized and starts practicing. So Noah and his family had been the only followers of God amongst the society of heathens. Think about that. The only followers of God upon this earth was Noah and his family. So they were nothing but heathens. Have any of y'all ever lived around heathens? <laughs> so you know where Noah was at, right? My mama called me heathens before, but, <laughs> but I really wasn't. She was just trying to get my attention. But he, he and his family were the only ones living amongst the society of heathens. Therefore, we see right here this practice of what they were doing was a singular practice. And it did not come in like us doing right here in what we call corporate worship. So there was none of that yet. So offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving was not a social, religious, economic, I guess you'd say habit of this day like we would say it would be today, like going to church is a social thing. This had not taken place. All this had just kind of go. So in ancient Near Eastern pagan worship, when a sacrifice was made, do you know why it was made? Do you know why they made the sacrifices back then? To appease the gods. To make them happy. They wanted to appease the God and keep them happy so the people would receive what? Good fortune. Kind of like prosperity gospel today. Give you a dollar and I'll give you, a, or buy my water and I'll give you money. That's kind of why they were doing it. So that's why they were doing these offerings. But you know, look, this is what I want you to make sure you understand. Noah did not offer a sacrifice out of the need to have good fortune. He didn't. He didn't do it either for a desire to keep God happy. That wasn't why he was doing it. He didn't do it to even make himself happy. Like a lot of people think if I go to church, it makes God happy and it takes care of my conscience. I don't feel guilty on Sunday afternoon for sleeping that extra hour and missing church. He didn't do it because of all that. What he did, he offered his sacrifice out of a heart of gratitude. His natural uh, uh, thing or thinking or what he was doing right here was he wanted to leave. He just wanted to get out of that huge box. Think about that. He just wanted to get out of that huge box and just praise God. He just wanted to say thank you. Now, let's remember, also consider a few more things about Noah that could have been what could have been or what he was seeing when he left the ark right here because I think you need to see all these things to understand this, what he was talking about, gratitude. If you could, for just a minute, think about the scenario. We already talked about him coming off, but for a solid year, put yourself in Noah's place. You're in this box. And just think about it. It was bigger than this. But it would probably feel like this if you had all them animals in it, in this sanctuary. He's in this, uh, uh, inside this dark ship. That ship was just drenched, drenched with the, the, the smell of cows, chickens, dogs, any kind of animal. And I'm sure they, it's hard to clean up all the, the mess that they made. You've been there. So every animal on earth was inside this box, and they were making a mess. That's about the easiest way I know to say it without gagging it, yeah, or whatever. And think about this time as you've been there. You've been tossed all the way around the world. Winds were coming, and it had been raining. It was raining cats and dogs because it was flooding the whole world. And when the ark finally come upon its rest there between the mountaintops, you walk out into the fresh air. Think about how fresh that air really was. What do you imagine your first act would be? Think about this. What do you think your first reaction would be? Right now, if you were going through some difficult days, you had been stuck in a place, and you're, you finally got freedom, what would be your first act? 
Mmm, that smells good. What would it be? Would it be an altar to say thank you? Thank you, God. In other words, would you be ready to have church in worship? You see, now, how does God respond to this act of gratitude that Noah shows right here? How does he respond? You see, God, knowing Noah's heart, he knows Noah's heart. Here's the thing. He knows Noah's heart. He understands that Noah was leaving the ship and offering a sacrifice. What he was doing was more than just a sacrifice. It wasn't just something, you know, sometimes when we sacrifice, we say, well, uh, it's a big sacrifice for me to do this. Sometimes the sacrifice is not really a sacrifice. In our minds it might be, but in our hearts, it's nothing. See, God knew Noah's heart. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he was really sacrificing. See, in Genesis 8, and you go on down to verse 21, listen. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike down again uh, every living creature as I have done. Now, verse, chapter 9, verse 1. And God ple- blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. As the aroma of Noah's sacrifice drift up to the, started drifting up to the Lord, his heart is touched. And in turn, he says, God says, I will never again curse the ground because of man's evil heart. He'll never send another flood. That's the, that's the promise. And that's what the rainbow means today. Okay? Just want you to make sure you know what the rainbow means. It means a promise from God, not some of this worldly stuff that they're talking about. I don't want you to give the devil credit. That's what it's all about. And then God blessed Noah. See, blessing Noah was not a response to anything Noah had done. This is what I want you to understand. It's not anything we do. This blessing was nothing, not a response to anything Noah had earned. His blessing was not because he was a stellar ship captain and he kept the ship afloat. Matter of fact, he had nothing to do with the ship floating, but he had nothing to do with that. It was nothing about keeping the morale of his crew high in high spirits nor having completed the ark. Just think about that, building it to God's specifications. It didn't have anything to do with that, and it wasn't a reward for his exceptional care of God's remaining creatures. Think about this. The responsibility put upon Noah to keep all the animals alive. None of what God was doing wasn't because of that. You see, Noah's blessing was not a response to his obedience. Was, was not even a response to his obedience. Although blessings are or do come from choosing obedience. Okay, let me make sure I under, you understand that. Blessings do come from obedience, but that's not what this blessing was about. You see, in this story, we learn that Noah received his blessing because he chose to worship. He chose to worship. That's why Noah received the blessing. It pleased the Lord. You see, it pleased the Lord because Noah's heart was thankful. And Noah's emotion overflowed. It overflowed into an act of gratitude. An offering. You know, we say an offering sometimes has to be put in a wooden plate. That isn't necessarily the case. It could be time. It could be so many things. But mostly it's a worship, thankful gratitude to our Lord. And that's what it was all about. But let me tell you, there's a word, the English word gratitude stems from a Latin word, grata, Eucharist. Now that's a Catholic word, I know, if you go in there. But I just want you to understand, this uh, Latin word, Eucharist, which is, stems from That which means to give thanks. The Bible takes this one word definition a little bit further though. In the Bible, gratitude is the word Eucharist. Okay? And I want you to understand, and that word stems from the word charis. And that word charis means grace. Grace. So we see where the Bible moves and it takes us into there and it moves us into grace. Now, grace, it's a favor. It's an act of goodwill and loving kindness for which we do not deserve. 
That's what grace is all about. It's something that we do not deserve. Aren't you glad of God's grace? You see, we see right here, Eucharist is an offering of thanks out of the abundance of grace. An offering of thanks out of the abundance of grace shown to us. It is to give thanks to the Lord with pleasure and delight because we have received delight and pleasure from His grace carried. You see, Eucharist is not a horizontal practice. It's, I mean, a horizontal practice. It's not a give and take. It's not, okay, Lord, I'm going to give you an extra 10, you give me 20. That's the way we think sometimes. Okay, Lord, I'm going to give you an hour, you just bless me the rest of the week. It's not a give and take. See, grace does not travel one way and then come back again. See, Eucharist is reciprocal. It is a cycle of giving and receiving all the time. It is grace abounding. You've ever heard that? You've heard that statement before. It's abounding. It's, it's constant. It's constant giving. Because I'm going to tell you what, that's what it's about. See, the Bible tells us that God does not desire sacrifice for sacrifice's sake. But he delights in our expressions, our dedication, and he, uh, I, when we declare praise and adoration to him, which is an outward expression of what our heart should be. In Psalms, I think it is, 51, verses 15 and 17, it says, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or would give it. You would not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a God you will not despise. You see, when God can break our heart, Dwight sang, he changed. When God came into his life, he was a different person. He changes us. And you see, that's what it's all about. The Bible tells us that God does not desire, not desire the sacrifice for sacrifice's sake. He doesn't want it just for sacrifice's sake. But that he delights in our expression when we declare praise and adoration to him. Which is the outward expression of what should be in our heart. Is that what's in your heart? We were talking, I think, and I remember. You know, we have a lot of stuff up here. But until it gets real right here, it doesn't come to life. When it gets here in our heart, then you start living what you know. We know all about Jesus. Satan knew about Jesus, but he didn't know him. You see, and that's what this is about, and that's what was happening in Noah. By choosing to practice gratitude, not just know the definition of it. We're not taking a test on it. You start living it when we choose the grace that God has freely offered us and is offering us to freely give it back to Him uh, and, and through serving others like a, a life like Miss Dot. She wasn't getting patted on the back at church for serving the people in the nursing home. She was doing it because she loved the people in the nursing home. She loved her neighbors. You know, I think it comes to real life when we get to that journey in our life where our room is shared maybe with another individual and then you start understanding who your neighbor is. Matter of fact, you might start understanding who your family is because you see, that's what becomes real then what's in our heart. What we have been taught in Sunday school becomes real. What we have been taught in Maybe Bible school becomes real because we have etched it in our heart. That's what it's about. And that's what the gratitude here is all about. I want to read you a story about a police officer. I read this story and I think it will bring to life what I'm trying to say. A police officer responding to a man threatening suicide. And I say this because I did a service Thursday night for a suicide victim. Tough. And I just got to thinking about this when I found this story. A police officer responding to a man threatening suicide by jumping off the top of a high building. When the officer arrived at the scene, the man on the ledge uttered as he positioned himself, perched to jump, No one loves me. No one cares if I die. 
No one will miss me. The officer said it was as if the man's despair was painfully evident as he repeated the sediment over and over. As other officers tried to talk him off the ledge, the officer realized the situ situation was getting worse, not better, and that the man on the ledge was going to jump. As the officer witnessed the man's pain, he said all he could think of at that moment was, I love this man. I care about this man. So this is what the officer offered the man on the ledge. You know, the, the feeling of love that he had for him, the officer wanted to share that. As the man continued to vocalize his brokenness, the officer generally stated, don't jump, I love you. You are loved. You're not alone. And someone cares for you. I care for you. I love you. The officer said he repeated this over and over. And as you find this story on the internet, they even have it to where you can even hear his voice saying this. It's real. The surrounding officers testified that these words brought the man out of his trance and despair. And as the officer continued to tell the stranger on the ledge that he loved him, the man climbed off the ledge and fell in the officer's arms. Crying, the officer held him, embraced him, and continued to repeat that he loved him. When the reporters asked the officer why he felt this way toward a man he did not even know, the officer replied something to this effect. I just felt like I loved him even though I did not even know him. And it broke my heart to see him feel so unloved. Because I'm loved, I knew I loved him. This is God's grace poured out in the expression of love. When we receive God's grace in our life, we naturally want to express it. Do you hear that? When you receive it, it should be a natural expression of us wanting to share. And you see, that's what it is. We do not always know how it will come out. We don't know if it's going to come out when we're in a nursing home rolling around or at the stop sign where somebody's sitting there with a sign or somebody coming through our parking lot to get a free cup of coffee and just say will you pray for me or knocking on the door saying I've been by your church God's just been calling me to maybe come visit I had that happen the other day and they, I welcome them but we never know and we never know when that person is on that ledge ready to jump because they feel like nobody loves them. Well, let me just take you back to our place one day. If there's ever been a time in your life when you felt like you were alone and lost and God said, I love you. You're loved. You can say, no, nobody loves me. And let me tell you, people, we need to be praying for our young people because our young people feel like that a lot of times because peer pressure is hard. Because, you know, you, we as adults feel peer pressure. We need to make sure we're living out this grace because grace is easy to recognize God's grace in a life of a person that loves God. Because when it's that way, when we're the recipient of that unmerited generosity, we want to share it, as Randall was saying, when he turned the light on in the pumpkin, when he turned the light on in the pumpkin, if you've received that grace, that light ought to be shining through your pumpkin body. And people ought to be seeing that unmerited grace that you receive, that they can receive it. You know, when your kids are growing up and you teach them how to say thank you, what did you say when they didn't say thank them? Don't be disrespectful, right? How many of you say that people are not respectful today? Disrespect. Poor Eric and I, I know Miss Debbie work in the school system. They see kids from all walks of life. They're not church kids. They're not all church kids, are they? They don't understand love. 
They don't understand thank you, please. They understand if you want it, you take it. Get it first before somebody else gets it. That's what we believe, and that's what the world is teaching. But you see, we need to be, they haven't maybe understood it yet because they've not received the grace that we have. How many of you are hoarders? I, I am. I think sometimes all Christians, sometimes we get like this. We're hoarders. We take everything God gives us and we keep it, which is good, but we don't give it away. Isn't there a song, Give It Away? The bass, Gaith or Volca Band, Give It Away. They sing that song and it's an upbeat song. And the reason it's an upbeat song, because we should be giving it away. Now, we can't give God's grace away, but we can be living it. People can be seeing it through us, and we can be sharing it. There's a lot more to that sermon, but time's gone. So I want us to say this morning, if you were Noah, I'm going to go back. If you were Noah, what would be the first thing you'd do off the boat? Would you come and just at the altar and worship him? Would you just come and worship him? Or would you say, I've been on this boat 365 days. I got to cut my grass. I got to go check my house. I got to go check the cows. I got to go check my job. What would you do? Because that tells what's the most important thing to us. Or would you just say, thank, or you like most parents when you've been cooped. My, my son and them are in a car going on vacation for a few days. They've been, they're cooped up with, I, I know what my son's doing. He's been cooped up with those three boys for three hours. He's going to jump out of the car and say, thank you, Lord, for getting me here. Rebecca, it's your turn. But what do you do? Do you just fall on your knees and say, thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me? There's not a person here that doesn't have blessings. And if you've never received the grace that I've been talking about, you don't understand it. You don't understand that it's nothing you do. Tell you what, guys, you can come to church for the rest of your life. Every day the doors are open. But if you don't receive the grace, the, the salvation that Jesus get, has provided for us free, it doesn't do you any good to come to church. And that's why it's hard a lot of times to share the grace. So our invitation this morning we gotta, is pretty simple. The grace is here to receive. Or maybe you just need to come and tell God, thank you. Maybe you need to get out of the boat and just come up to the altar and say, thank you, Lord, for whatever he's done for you. But whatever it is, just do it. Father, we commit this time to you. Lord, whatever you do, whatever you say, we just praise you. Lord, I thank you for life. I thank you for this church. I thank you for your people sitting here this morning. And Lord, most of all, I thank you for the grace that is free to me and everyone. And Lord, I thank you that you didn't give me what I deserve, but you gave me what you wanted me to have, and that was your love. Help your love to shine through me, Father, that others might see you through everything that I do, and I pray as a church, that's our prayer. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Won't you stand? Wherever he leads, I'll go.
All God's people said. I hope you received a blessing from what God said today. And just be in prayer for one another. And let's go out. And, you know, I, I can't help but say this before. Let's go out with the love that that, that police officer had for everybody we meet. We don't know why we love them, but we know God loves them. So let's love them. They might just need that, hey, I love you. I love you. Might even open the door for us to share Christ. You never know. What a great day it's been. Don't forget our activities tonight, Wednesday night, our missions night, all the things that will be taking place. Our services for Mark on Tuesday. Let's remember those. And just be in prayer for one another. Tommy Murdoch, would you close us in prayer? Thank you.